because we, we, were, we were never recognized. We didn't even have a homecoming. Tonight, November 8th, the day to honor Indigenous veterans. I'm not sure that healing lodges in this context are appropriate for people who have brutally murdered children. After public outcry, a high-profile inmate of a healing lodge is now back in jail. You know, to lose a major retailer like this or to potentially lose a, a major retailer like this could have a big impact on the city. And a huge fire in Iqaluit, Nunavut. The North Mart almost goes entirely up in flames. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. Many Indigenous soldiers enlisted to fight in the First World War. Some never made it home, but are still honored in the land where they fell. Alex Dakota is one such soldier. Daryl Stranger has more. Alex Dakota from Red Pheasant First Nation served in World War I. He was an athlete, police officer, and soldier. Dakota, known for his athletic ability, especially running, represented Canada at the 1912 Olympic Games in Stockholm, Sweden although leg cramps led him to a sixth place finish in the final race. A marathon is run in his honor in Passchendaele, Belgium. In 1911, Dakota became the first indigenous police officer in Canada, becoming a constable with the Edmonton police. Dakota enlisted in the Canadian Expeditionary Force in April of 1916, setting sail for England on November 24, 1916. His running skills were put to use as he served as a communications trench runner. Alex Dakota was killed by a German sniper on October 30th, 1917, during the Second Battle of Passchendaele. He was 28 years old. He left a lasting remark in Belgium. The town of Passchendaele holds a poppy's run in memoriam of him every year. Alex Dakota. Gone but not forgotten. Over 100 people gathered in Winnipeg for the annual Aboriginal Veterans Day. A ceremony took place honoring the hundreds of Indigenous veterans from Manitoba, as well as the thousands from across Canada. Ashley Branson has that story. November 8th commemorates National Aboriginal Veterans Day, a day to acknowledge and pay respect to more than 12,000 men and women who have served this country. Aboriginal Member of the Aboriginal Legion Colour Party, Jerry Woodhouse, shares his thoughts on this significant well, day. Aboriginal Day, it's, for us, is very special because we, we, were, we were never recognized. We didn't even have a homecoming. But now several ceremonies take place across the nation, counting one in Winnipeg, where the day was recognized back in 1994. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place and in the sky, the larks still bravely sing and fly. Veterans and supporters assembled in the heart of the city at the Niganon Center, Teacher Marcy Abraham explains why she encourages her students to participate in this special event. We want them to remember, to remember, you know, the contributions that our veterans had um, did in World War One and World War Two and the Cold War, and just remembering their um, yeah their contributions that they made to society and just not forgetting, you know, what they've done for for our people. This is Master Corporal Danielle McCutcheon's first time participating in this particular ceremony. To see the community here uh, come together to partake in the ceremony and partake in feast is, uh, is really heartwarming and I'm so proud. Ashley Branson, APTN National News, Winnipeg. To Ottawa now, where Canada's War Museum celebrated National Indigenous Veterans Day. It's a day to shine the light on the contribution of First Nations, Métis and Inuit service men and women who are often overlooked. Over the lunch hour, a small crowd gathered to listen about the sacrifices made 
According to historian John Moses, more than 12,000 indigenous men and women served during the two world wars and the Korean War. He says it's a significant contribution that needs to be taught in schools. Certainly within the, you know, the school curriculums across all jurisdictions, there, ne there needs to be um, increased coverage relative to uh, Indigenous contributions to Canada's military heritage and not just uh, sort of in the older historical sense in terms of what happened at the time of the American Revolution or during the War of 1812, but certainly during the, you know, if we want to call them the modern wars of the 20th century, including the First and Second World War and the Korean War. Convicted child killer Terry Lynn McClintock is heading back to jail, and the largest grocery store in Iqaluit is a total loss. Those stories and more coming up after the break. Here's a look at Friday's weather forecast starting on the East Coast. Sunny and 8 for Halifax, plus 7 under the sun in Fredericton. Zero in Nain, minus 1 for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Four above with showers for Montreal, a rain-snow mix and minus two in Val d'Or. A rain-snow mix and four above for London and Toronto, plus one in North Bay. Minus four for Thunder Bay, zero in Wawa, Sudbury and Elliott Lake. Sunny and chilly in northern Manitoba, minus 17 in Churchill. Minus seven with snow in Winnipeg, minus nine for Brandon and Dauphin. In Saskatchewan, 10 below with rain for Yorkton, 7 and showers in Swift Current. Minus 10 in LaRange, minus 11 for Stony Rapids. Welcome back. Child killer Terry Lynn McClintock is back behind bars. McClintock was transferred from the Okima Ochi Healing Lodge in Saskatchewan to the Edmonton Institute for Women. McClintock is serving a life sentence after pleading guilty to the kidnapping and killing of eight-year-old Tori Stafford in 2009. Her placement to the Healing Lodge provoked protests <clears throat> excuse me, on Parliament Hill and in Tori Stafford's hometown of Woodstock, Ontario. Many protesters were upset that an admitted child killer would be eligible for treatment in the Healing Lodge. At a Women's Justice Forum in Edmonton, the executive director of a Healing Lodge in Calgary agreed. Well, in my opinion, healing lodges are intended for people who have uh, suffered a trauma and that require culturally safe environments to heal from. I'm not sure that healing lodges in this context are appropriate for people who have brutally murdered children. So uh, uh, perhaps the, the, the Edmonton Institution would be a better alternative at this point. Tori Stafford's father, Rodney, has been campaigning to have Terry Lynn McClintock put back behind bars since he heard about the transfer to the Healing Lodge last December. Corrections Canada told him McClintock was being moved back to prison this morning. He's happy with that, but thinks Corrections Canada should take one more step forward. Um, basically, that just uh, she had been moved overnight last night. Um, <clears throat> that her security was still classified as medium and that um, uh, her, her file would be under review. Um, and I'm hoping that's to reclassify her as maximum security, as she should be. A fire has destroyed half of Iqaluit's largest retail and grocery store. Iqaluit's fire department responded to the North Mart just after 1 a.m. this morning. There is still smoke coming off the wreckage. Our Kent Driscoll is there. Thanks. And you may be able to see behind me, uh, the Akalawit North Mark continues to smolder. Akalawit firefighters received a call at around 1 a.m. this morning and have been responding ever since. But the thing that has Akalawit residents the most worried? This was far from the only fire in Akalawit last night. This is the scene most Akalawit residents woke up to this morning. The largest grocery store in town was burning rapidly. For a fly-in community, losing a store that sells the majority of groceries in the city could be devastating. This fire is under investigation by the fire marshal's office and the RCMP. They say it's too early to comment on that investigation. But the fire department can tell us 
It wasn't the only fire in that part of town last night. Yes, we responded to uh, five um, different fires in five different locations. Three of them were vehicle fires and two structure fires, one being the one that uh, we're still on today. As for the response, the city put in their emergency plan, which involved bringing in the airport firefighters to supplement the Akaluit FD. Firefighters from neighboring Pangertung have been flown in as well to allow the firefighters to rest. The building closest to the North Mart is the Elder Center, a retirement home. The elders were evacuated around 5.30 a.m. this morning and will be spending the night in a hotel. No one was injured in the fire. The section that is burned is the back of the North Mart, a large warehouse, furniture store, and snowmobile shop. The front of the store, the retail floor, may still be saved. The, the actual warehouse and the, the store has probably got a 15-foot uh, uh, space between it, so that really helps out, So which means that both walls would have to have a two-hour fire rating. So with the uh, with uh, direct flame impact onto that. Water delivery, much of a Kaluid is supplied by water truck, has been suspended so that the trucks can bring extra water to the fire scene. The city's asking residents to conserve water, avoid the scene of the fire, and to not begin hoarding food. There were some early rushes on a Kaluid's other retailers, but that subsided quickly. Provision of food is, is an important duty for any business that uh, that's you know, working in the city here. So, you know, to lose a major retailer like this or to potentially lose a, a major retailer like this could have a big impact on the city. So ultimately, as this event progresses, it's up to the city to provide as much assistance as we possibly can to alleviate some of the, uh, the concerns that come along with this. North Mart has four convenience stores here in Iqaluit and plan to distribute as much fresh food as they can to there. Any extra will be provided to their competitor, Arctic Ventures, to make sure the food supply continues. Kent Driscoll, APTN National News, Halloween. And back here at the scene, firefighters continue working away at this smoldering scene. The major concern that Iqaluit residents are left with, it isn't food supply. There were five fires within three hours last night here in Iqaluit. And that doesn't sound like a series of accidents. It is certain we will be coming back to this story. Back to you in Winnipeg. Yesterday, we brought you a story about a former social worker in British Columbia who's being sued for allegedly defrauding kids out of government support payments. APTN's Tina House has more on this developing story. Jason Graddle is the lawyer representing dozens of children in a civil lawsuit against this man, Robert Riley Saunders of Kelowna, B.C. Saunders allegedly bilked dozens of kids, mostly Indigenous, that were in his care while he was a social worker. Riley Saunders misappropriated funds intended for the food, clothing and shelter of um, children in custody of, of the province uh, and just transferred funds intended from them uh, to his own account. Robert Riley Saunders was fired sometime last year from the ministry. But Gradle says Saunders' last fraudulent transaction was last December. He would take the lion's share, all, everything that was supposed to go to them for food, clothing and shelter, all of their rent money, all of their monthly allowances, and sometimes he'd throw them a little bone, like give them a, a Walmart gift certificate for a um, hundred bucks or a food voucher for $50 so they could buy a few groceries if they complained loudly enough about being hungry. Grand Chief Stuart Phillips says it's unbelievable that something like this could happen. I think it's shocking that anyone would take advantage of, of uh, youth, um, you know, that are struggling with the day-to-day -day challenges. Lawyer Jason Gradle says Saunders was not monitored within the Ministry of Child and Family Development, all the way from the team lead to the manager to the executive director in charge of the Kelowna region, where the alleged crimes took place. Frankly, the ministry has known about this problem for a long time and wasn't forthcoming with uh, information. The facts of the fraud wasn't uh, told to the children who were affected and the ministry didn't take timely steps to ameliorate the situation, make sure the kids had a proper place to live and food and clothing allowances, as you might expect. So um, litigation was considered to be the, uh, uh, the basically the last resort here. 
BC Media have reported that Riley Saunders is currently employed at Okanagan College in Kelowna, BC with adult special learning, but is currently on leave. All of these allegations have not been proven in court. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. A second agreement between Manitoba Hydro and the Manitoba Métis Federation was terminated by the provincial government last week. Now one of the Manitoba government's cabinet ministers is being questioned over a public statement about representing Métis. Our Daryl Stranger has more. There is fallout from an announcement made by the Manitoba government last week after they exercised the termination clause on a hydro agreement with the Manitoba Métis Federation. We're going to live it in every day in our lives for the rest of our lives. And, and so generations that come has got to feel this. The cancelled agreement would have provided the MMF with $20 million for its support of hydro projects. And we think that it's important uh, not to rely on the old practices of paying people not to consult. That was the origins of the original agreement and that's not uh, how we're going to go uh, about things going forward. This is the second deal the Manitoba government has terminated this year with the Manitoba Métis Federation. Its president, David Chartrand, says this is a war against the Métis. So he was absolutely misleading and lying to the people that this had taken place. So, you know, so, but he said to the public, it, it, it disallowed the Métis from participating, which is absolutely wrong. Look at the date of the signed agreement. In a following press conference, Premier Pallister's Minister of Crown Services, Colleen Mayer, defended cancelling the agreement. I represent all Métis in the province of Manitoba. Not just those that belong to the MMF. All voices I've heard from, I represent all of them because I'm an elected official that sits on cabinet. What Mayor stated, however, is news to Chartrand. It's convenient for her right now and it's convenient for the Premier. The Premier actually is using her uh, for his own uh, personal political agenda. According to the PC government list for Indigenous candidates provided to APTN ahead of the 2016 election, Mayor was not one of those candidates. They listed five candidates, Bob Lagasse, Sarah Langevin, Alan Lajemodier, Belinda Squants, and Edna Nabis. Mayor's website does not acknowledge her being Métis, and when APTN asked Minister Mayor for an interview, she declined. Mayor's representatives provided this statement by email. Minister Mayor is Métis and is a card-carrying member of the MMF. David Chartrand maintains he is the only one who represents Métis people in the province, and not her and her government. To be honest with you, as, a pres as president, I feel bad for her. I don't want to uh, attack a citizen of mine, but I, I can't just let her uh, state, state, make statements and, mis and mis mislead most Manitobans. Métis will know full well she doesn't represent them. She knows it, that Métis are not going to be fooled by her statement. Daryl Stranger, APTN National News, Winnipeg. To Calgary now, where the city wants to host the Olympic Winter Games in 2026. While a lot of Calgarians on social media say the Games will cost the city too much, some Indigenous leaders say the event will benefit urban Indigenous youth and First Nation communities. Tamara Pimentel has more. When Calgary hosted the Olympic Games in 1988, nations from Treaty 7 were showcased in the opening ceremonies. Now Calgarians prepare to vote for or against a bid to host the Games in 2026. 22-year-old Riley Many Bears says, vote yes. He feels it's time Indigenous youth are also showcased as athletes. I, I really hope these games go through and, you know, um, it'll be great, you know, seeing these, you know, First Nations athletes competing on Blackfoot territory. You know. Many Bears is a distance runner from Siksika Nation. He attended a rally in support of the bid. He says having the Olympics on Blackfoot territory would give youth the opportunity to train and compete. In a youth perspective, you know, like I face many bears. Barriers, you know, like lack of, you know, these facilities or lack of like resources, funding. So for First Nations community, when these games do happen, First Nations will feel, will feel a part of Canada. 
Community leader Michelle Robinson says she is all for hosting the Olympics as long as sports reconciliation calls to action is included. And the sports calls to action actually talks about uh, Indigenous youth inclusion and the, and the barriers that they face and how we have to reduce the barriers. So from my point of view, I want to see our next generation of Indigenous youth included and inspired and um, promoted to continue on with sports and becoming the next Olympic athlete that represents Canada. The cost to host the Games in Calgary is estimated at approximately $5.1 billion. That price tag would be shared by the city, provincial and federal government. Calgarians will cast their ballots on November 13th. It's Mayor Pimentel, APTN National News, Calgary. Time to step aside for another quick break, but first, here's a look at tonight's Nation to Nation. Hello, I'm Todd Lamara, and here's what's coming up on Nation to Nation. There was a big announcement earlier this week on trying to end homelessness. Minister of Families, Children, and Social Development announced big dollars to do so, and that Indigenous agencies will get substantial funding, but details are still lacking. Panel of MPs debates. As well, the Minister of Public Safety wants to enshrine the GLADU principle into law. But will this do anything to stem the ongoing rise in over-incarceration rates of Indigenous people? A GLADU expert weighs in. That's immediately following the national news. Here's a look at the rest of Friday's weather forecast. Minus 8 and snow for high level in Fort Chip. Zero and snow for Medicine Hat, plus four with rain in Lethbridge. Seven above with showers for Campbell River in Vancouver. Minus eight and snow for Fort Nelson. Three above under the sun in Smithers. Minus 16 for Mayo and Beaver Creek. Minus seven in Whitehorse. Minus 12 for Fort Simpson, Wrigley and Norman Wells. Minus 14 for Saks Harbor and Colville Lake. Minus 10 in Fort McPherson. Minus 27 for Baker Lake. 21 below in Cambridge Bay. Minus 18 in Repulse Bay. Minus 24 in Joe Haven and Resolute. Welcome back. The Métis have been left out of the federal government's 60 scoop settlement. But why? That's a question APTN Investigates reporter Cullen Crozier wanted to look at in his episode, Adopt an Indian. Here's a look at what he found. Paternalism, racism, the belief that their uh, culture and, and value system was superior to ours. But you see, as you get older, you've got a longing to know where you're from, uh, who your brothers and sisters are. And, and to reconnect with that side of your family because that's, that's what's missing. Something is missing from you. My name is Robert Doucette. I am originally a Mackay from uh, Northwest Saskatchewan. I was born February 28, 1962. I am of Cree, Métis, Dene ancestry. Uh, I was um, taken away when I was four months old. I think one of the reasons why was was because, uh, firstly, my mother was Aboriginal. She's Métis. And uh, the Canadian and, Pro and the provincial governments have a long-standing, uh, they've got a long-standing goal to assimilate Aboriginal people. I think, I think uh, that racist notion that they could raise our kids better than us predominated. And you won't want to miss that episode. It airs tomorrow night right after the news. And that is your APTN National News for this Thursday. For more, including the latest on the fire in Iqaluit, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. Now stick around for Nation to Nation with Todd Lamarand. I'm Dennis Ward. Have a good night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.